and so we've gone through all these slides and we stopped with the muscles of inspiration and expiration. <coughs> so the reason why we were talking about the muscles of inspiration and expiration is that they actually change the volume of the thoracic cavity and corporeal cavities, and as volume changes, pressure changes. So the law that guides that is called Boyle's Law. And what Boyle's Law says is pressure is inversely related to volume. So that if we start out with a volume of one liter, then we have a pressure of one atmosphere. And so we typically measure pressures either in atmospheres, and that's based upon the pressure of the atmosphere at sea level or we measure pressures in millimeters of mercury. So it's kind of two ways in which pressures are, are, are measured. Okay. So what Boyle's Law says is if we decrease the volume to a half a liter, then the pressure is inversely related. So the pressure would increase, it would actually double to two atmospheres. And so that's what's actually working in our plural cavities to allow us to exchange gas. And then in this instance, when we're dealing with pressure, we have to remember that molecules are moving, constantly moving, and we're talking about the pressure of the moving molecules as they collide against the wall of the chamber. Okay. So when we look at the human body, then we have a membrane that, sound, that surrounds the outside of our pleural cavities. So these membranes right here would be the parietal pleura. We have a membrane that covers the lung itself. And so the membrane that would cover the lung itself is the visceral pleura. And so then this space then is a cavity, and that cavity is the Plural cavity, okay? So, so we have a cavity outside the lungs that we have to be concerned about the plural cavity. And then inside the lungs, remember our functional unit is constructed of these great cluster like things that we call alveolar sacs. And then each little ground thing is a alveolus. And so we have this, these alveolar spaces inside of our lungs as well. Okay. So then when, we have to, when we're thinking about pressure, we have to think about pressure on the outside of the body. So that would be atmospheric pressure. And then we have to worry about the pressure within these spaces, within our lungs. So that's going to be alveolar pressure. And then we have to worry about the pressure that exists on the outside of the lungs in the pleural cavity, and so that pressure is intrapleural pressure. So anytime we're thinking about gas exchange with lungs, we have actually three pressures that we have to think about. And so the one relationship that doesn't change in normal physiology is the relationship between alveolar pressure and intrapleural pressure. So for your lungs to work correctly, then intrapleural pressure always has to be less than alveolar pressure. Okay. So notice that at rest, which is where you've just taken a breath out and you're at a pause between the next breath in, then alveolar pressure is greater than intrapleural pressure. So during inspiration, when the diaphragm contracts, alveolar pressure is still greater than intrapleural pressure. And then when the diaphragm is relaxing, the increase in abdominal pressure is doming the diaphragm back up, and alveolar pressure is greater than intrapleural pressure. So that relationship in normal physiology is constant, no matter what cycle within the respiratory cycle you're in. Uh, uh, alveolar pressure is always greater than intrapleural pressure. So then in a clinical environment, what would cause that to change is a perforation of the parietal pleura. So if anything punctures this outside membrane, the parietal pleura, uh, 
and compromises the chest wall, then atmospheric pressure will cause, when the first patient tries to take their next breath out, in, atmospheric pressure will be drawn into that and their lung will collapse. And then it lets you can vacate the pressure out of the out of that the lung will stay collapsed. So that's the problem with gunshot wounds, knife wounds, uh, any penetration, car wrecks where ribs have penetrated, then you're gonna get a collapsed lung on that side and the lung won't will not reinflate. So we call those sucking chest wounds because because you're actually sucking in that atmospheric pressure as you try to breathe. All right. So then the two pressures that have to be different for this system to work, to work is alveolar pressure and atmospheric pressure. So ideally, if you've just taken a breath out and you're at the pause between your next inspiration, then alveolar pressure and atmospheric pressure are the same. And that's why there is no airflow whatsoever. So as soon as your diaphragm contracts, then the diaphragm drops so the thoracic volume increases, and therefore the, the volume of the pleural cavity increases. And then if you understand Boyle's law, if volume increases, pressure should decrease. So since the pleural pressure, since the pleural cavities are increasing and the lung is expanding, so the atmosphere, the the space inside the lung is expanding, then alveolar pressure drops and intrapleural pressure drops. And as soon as alveolar pressure is less than atmospheric pressure, the air is going to move from an area of high pressure to an area of low pressure, and you're gonna breathe in or do an inspiration. <coughs> so as soon as the diaphragm relaxes, what's been going on with your abdominal cavity is exactly the opposite. So when the diaphragm drops, the, the volume of the abdominal class cavity decreases, so the pressure in the abdominal cavity increases. Okay. So as soon as the diaphragm relaxes and the muscle isn't holding it in place, then the increased pressure under the diaphragm in the abdominal cavity causes the diaphragm to dome back up. And as the diaphragm domes back up, then Plural, the pleural cavity volume decreases, the alveolar space volume decreases, so intrapleural pressure goes up and alveolar pressure goes up. And as soon as alveolar pressure exceeds atmospheric pressure, then you breathe out. So during quiet breathing, we're just creating a, a small change in pressure that allows us to bring air in and out. So as oxygen demand goes up, such as in exercise, and you need to exchange the ga more gas, then that's why we use our secondary muscles of inspiration to pull the rib cage up higher, so that as the diaphragm is dropping, the rib cage is also going up. So we get a, a larger change in volume. So we get a bigger drop in pressure, and then air flows much more quickly into your lungs, okay? And then when we begin to do an expiration, we engage the secondary muscles of expiration. So the rectus abdominis muscles pull the rib cage back down, and then the abdominal muscles compress the abdomen. So bringing the rib cage back down is gonna, is gonna decrease the volume in the pleural cavities and the alveolar space which is going to drive pressure up. And then the increase in abdominal pressure drives the diaphragm up. So that you get a further drop in, in that. All right, so, so we're going to work with that on Tuesday, uh, tomorrow in lab, and we're going to make some measurements of your air exchange capacity. All right, <clears throat> so the way we can think about it is we can think about quiet breathing, normal quiet breathing is what you do when you're, when you're passive. And then the more technical name for that is eupenia. And we'll talk about that in lab tomorrow. And during that period of time, what's actually going on is the medullary rhythmicity area, uh, which is in the medulla oblongata, 
is responsible for sending a signal to the diaphragm. And so what it does is it sends a signal to the diaphragm to contract. And then the uh, contraction of the diaphragm dropping increases the pleural volume and increases the alveolar space drop volume. Alveolar pressure drops and we breathe in. And then the, the medullary arrhythmus theory stops sending a signal, which causes the diaphragm to relax. And then the increase in abdominal pressure plus the elastic connective tissue associated with the thoracic wall and the lungs causes the thoracic cavity to recoil and the diaphragm to go back up. And so alveolar pressure exceeds uh, 760 and you breathe out. So what happens in, in more labored breathing is that there are two control centers in the pons. So one's called a pneumotaxic area and one's called an amnustic area. And these are on a slide here in a little bit that we're gonna look at, okay? And then what happens is uh, they alter the pattern of the medullary rhythmicity area. And so what they'll do is they send the, cause the, they will stimulate the inspiratory area and it'll send a signal, an additional signal to your muscles of, secondary muscles of inspiration, which create a more forceful inspiration. And then send signals to the uh, secondary muscles of expiration and, and create a more forceful expiration. So we have two mechanisms by which we can control that respiration. We'll come back and review that a little bit. <coughs> so, because we have these alveolar spaces, so remember that we always we have these type one septal cells, which are simple squamous cells. Simple squamous cells always sit on a basement membrane. An underlying basement membrane is always a thin layer of areolar connective. So that's where the elastic fibers are found that cause the recoil to actually occur, right? And then the other thing that happens is, is we have to maintain this surface as being moist uh, for us to respire. So usually what happens if you're caught in a fire, uh, and then, so I don't know if you heard about the tragedy in Brazil where over 200 people died in a nightclub there was only one exit out. So what actually happens when you breathe that really hot air is it dries your lungs. And as soon as your lung surface is dry, you can't diffuse gases anymore. So we have to actually maintain a wet surface area to actually diffuse oxygen and carbon dioxide in and out of the blood. Well, because the water does hydrogen bonding between water molecules, then we actually have surface tension. And then what we have to what we have to do in normal physiology is depending upon these type 2 alveolar cells to produce a compound called surfactant that actually decreases the hydrogen bonding between water and actually decreases that surface tension. So in normal physiology, we're having to alter the way water behaves so our alveoli don't collapse. So in newborn babies who don't produce surfactant, then that's what happens is their lungs actually collapse, and that's why they're in neonatal intensive care units under respiratory distress, and we have to manage that in a clinical environment. And we've created a new solution that we can actually put into their lungs, and that solution helps prevent that alveolar collapse. Now, what about really, really cold? When I worked at Burger King, I was one of the few people who could stock the freezer. Everyone else smoked, and nobody could enter there for more than a minute and a half before they they couldn't tolerate the cold air. Wheezing. Yeah. Uh, well, there's two things about smoking. Is smoking compromises your vascular network to your extremities, and so they have more trouble just maintaining the blood flow supply to the extremities to keep their hands and feet. And it also compromises eventually blood flow to the lungs as well. Oh, okay. 
So that when you get cold, you do further vasoconstriction. And you've already got a compromised uh, cardiovascular system because of the impact on, on arteries. So there are several uh, compounds in cigarette smoke that alter the elastic fibers uh, in artery and vein walls. So arteries and veins are, again, lined by simple squamous that'll sit on a basement membrane, and then there'll be a thin layer of alveolar connective tissue. So what, what the compounds in cigarette smoke do is they alter those elastic fibers and they cause an irritation. And then eventually what happens is uh, collagen fibers actually will begin to be uh, exposed at the areas where uh, the squamous cells are overlapping. And as soon as collagen fibers are exposed to the lumen of a artery or vein, then you build plaque, which is why there's such a strong correlation with heart attacks and cigarettes and, and the occlusion of coronary arteries because of the damage that occurs in the vasculars. How, how cold of air can lungs tolerate? Uh, naturally, maybe 30, 40 below zero. Okay. You can warm air. Usually much lower than that, you have to put a mask on to try to super warm air before it gets in there. Alright. So, if you were an RT, a respiratory therapist, then what you do post-operatively with patients or patients who have compromised respiratory systems is try to work with them with breathing techniques that allow them to exchange air uh, better. And so the word we use for that is compliance. So in other words, RTs try to get people in compliance after surgeries and work with people who have compromised respiratory systems to work toward compliance. So if it, when we're thinking about homeostasis, then we want to make sure that our pulmonary ventilation system is compliant, that we can move air easily in and out of our lungs. And then the things that create problems are the things that create low compliance, where there's a resistance to the expansion of the thoracic wall, there's a resistance to the expansion of the alveoli, so that we can create those negative pressures. Okay. So if you're out of compliance, then you're not able to create a strong negative pressure, so you can't bring air in. So postoperatively, a lot of times when people have had abdominal surgeries, they don't want to breathe because it hurts. Yes. And so RTs have to work with them to, to on, on breathing techniques to do that. To have a machine where they have to actually make the little ball go up to a certain level, and or else they're not doing it right. Just so it gives the brain something visually to look at, so they do in order to know with respiration itself. So the kind of things that decrease compliance that we're concerned about in the clinical environment would be a lung infection called tuberculosis. And so probably everybody in here has had a TB test at least once in a while. And so those TB tests are designed to pick up antibodies that means you've been exposed to the bacterium that causes tuberculosis. So one of the things that's happening is why is we've used a lot of antibiotics to try to manage tuberculosis, and now we have antibiotic-resistant tuberculosis. So that it's getting harder and harder to actually uh, manage tuberculosis if you're exposed to. So in the United States, the exposure rate's still reasonably low. Uh, your highest exposure rate is in airplanes if you have a group of people from variation, various places in the world in the plane with you. Because in airplanes, you're recycling the air all the time. Which if you've never thought about it, you're in a plane for four or five hours in the air, and everybody goes to sleep. Because the amount of oxygen is actually decreasing, the amount of carbon dioxide is actually increasing because everybody's in a confined environment. So there I know people who will not ride on a plane without a car. This is paranoid. 
getting tuberculosis. And then if you ever travel overseas, if you ever travel anywhere in Africa, Central and South America, and Asia, then that's an exposure issue with tuberculosis. And then if you are, to be, if you are positive for tuberculosis, uh, they can actually recommend that you don't ever fly on the plane. So there was actually a guy in Seattle who had tuberculosis, had an antibiotic resistant tuberculosis. He was told not to fly on planes, but he was wanting to go back to his home country to get married, and so he flew anyway. And so then they ended up having to test everybody on the plane for, for tuberculosis. Pardon? Is that for your life? Yeah, if you have an antibiotic form of tuberculosis. And then there are certain drugs we use that you cannot use either. So if you've been exposed to tuberculosis. And that's certainly why healthcare providers are always tested for tuberculosis. So uh, the other, and I've got a picture of, uh, of lungs that have been, uh, have scar tissue with tuberculosis. So what actually happens is the bacteria begin to break down the break down the connective tissue in the lungs, and then as the connective tissue in the lungs gets broken down, you reconstruct the connective tissue, but with more collagen and less elastic fibers, so the lungs don't expand, and so then they don't expand and replace as well. So the other one is pulmonary edema, so that's fluid retention of tissues. So that's probably one of the major killers of elderly is pulmonary edema associated with pneumonia. And so pneumonia is one of the, the big killers of elderly people. So if you were listening to the news over the break, one of the former presidents that was in intensive care for almost a month had been in the hospital for almost two months because of pneumonia. And so he was in intensive care because he, he, was, he actually had pulmonary edema and they were trying to manage the pulmonary edema that occurs. You can also get pulmonary edema from cardiac dysfunction. So one of the common things about heart attacks is that you can survive your heart attack but get pulmonary edema that has to be managed as well. And then the other common place to get pulmonary edema is any high elevation activity. So some people at sea level sometimes uh, that don't ever get up in the mountains will decide to go on a ski trip. They'll fly into Jackson, Wyoming, and they'll be up now at 12,000 feet skiing and they die from pulmonary edema. So, so it's one way that people die. And you know, Ross Kelly, the climber, that has attempted Everest a number of times, has done it twice where he's successful, five times where he wasn't, and he wasn't successful the other five times because he had pulmonary edema that prevented him from to do the climb. So that's, that's something, particularly in the West, in the United States, that, that you would see the fighting climb environment as well. People who are trying to not climb to high elevations and stuff end up with pulmonary edema. And you can get it for other reasons as well. And as we talked about, respiratory distress syndrome, which is in immature, in premature infants, is due to that lack of surfactant. So since we don't have the surfactant, the, the hydrogen bonding of water molecules is greater. So when they breathe out, the lungs collapse, and then it's really hard to expand them again. So as the lungs collapse, it, it, it decreases your compliance significantly. And then the other thing we would see in the clinical environment is people with spinal cord trauma, particularly cervical spinal cord trauma, uh, get damage to the nerves uh, like, like the uh, the uh, phrenic nerve, they actually innervate the diaphragm, and then they they have trouble breathing because they've got muscle paralysis, and that reduces compliance as well. And then eventually, if if you are exposed to agents like cigarette smoke and a number of other compounds that you can be exposed to in some environmental uh, ways from certain occupations is you end up with this destruction of the fibers and alveolar walls so they don't want to expand and recoil the blood. So you end up with how the fibers do all of those. <coughs> so this was a picture I, I just kind of I showed you last time. So, so what you can't see very well in the picture is that the inside of the chest wall here 
would be lined with the membrane that we call the parietal peritoneum. This real shiny, excuse me, parietal pleura, this real shiny surface on the lungs is the visceral pleura. And this dark space we're seeing here is actually the pleural cavity. Okay. So that's what we're actually looking at. And then, and then uh, remember that the right lung is larger than the left lung, and you can clearly see it in this picture because the heart sets disproportionately to the left. So how many lobes do we have over here? Three. Three, Three lobes, and how many lobes do we have over here? Two. Two lobes. What's the unique uh, fissure that we have over here? Horizontal. Horizontal. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> so, now I showed you this picture as well. So this is actually a, a lung with uh, a normal lung, uh, and this is actually a lung with emphysema. And these big giant things here are actually where the, the connective tissue in the lung is broken down. And as it's broken down, the alveolar sacs are collapsing. So you go from having more defiant spaces to these giant big open air spaces in the lungs that you're seeing here. So I, I was trying to remember this picture when I captured it. Uh, and I can't remember if this was a it was either a chronic smoker or a coal miner, one or the, one or the other, uh, that was exposed to a lot of dust over time. Okay. <coughs> so the other thing we have is to think about when we're thinking about respiration is resistance. And so anytime you have a substance moving through a tube, whether it's a liquid or in this instance we're talking about gas, then what actually happens is the gas that is not in contact with the wall is flowing faster than the gas at the edge that's in contact with the, with, with the wall of the tube. And so that resistance is actually the interaction of water molecules, hydrogen bonding with, with the gases, and it, it causes resistance. So the way our, our respiratory uh, apparatus is designed is the trachea would have the least resistance. As soon as the trachea branches into primary bronchi, resistance would increase. As soon as primary bronchi branch into secondary bronchi, resistance would increase. As soon as secondary bronchi branch into tertiary bronchi, resistance increases. As we get to bronchioli, resistance increases. Okay. So that's why with, with the trachea and primary bronchi, and to some extent secondary bronchi, we don't have to worry about being able to change their shape much. But as we get into the smaller and smaller tubes, bronchioli and terminal bronchioli, and tertiary bronchioli, then we have smooth muscle that allows us to change the shape of the tube. Okay. So if somebody has COPD, the reason why they use an inhalation agent is the agent relaxes the smooth muscle, causes dilation of the airways, which decreases resistance and allows them to breathe more freely. So if you have somebody with COPD and the COPD is stimulated by either anxiety uh, or agents that they're exposed to, then what actually happens is when they're exposed to certain compounds, then all of the muscles contract, which greatly increases resistance and then they have trouble breathing. So then you have to use CO, then you have to use compounds to do that. So in a hospital with somebody with really bad pneumonia, they actually put masks on them that have a vapor that goes into them that they're breathing treatments. Now the, the, the vapor is, contains a compound that causes smooth muscles to relax and it, and it dilates all their, their airways so that they can breathe more, more easily and then they do those repeatedly trying to get the airway to open up. Are there ever times in which increasing airway resistance is actually beneficial 
Well, to, to maintain pressure, you have to change the airways from quiet breathing to labored breathing. So yeah, so during labored breathing, like when you're exercising, you want those airways to dilate as much as possible. So you decrease resistance so that air flows more freely. When you're breathing quietly, then you don't need as much air exchange. And if you left them open, you would get too great a drop of pressure just in the tubes itself compared to the lungs. And so then you actually do constrict the airways. Okay. So one of the things that does greatly increase airway resistance is, is COPD or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease from asthma uh, that we commonly call as asthma. And asthma is caused by a bunch of different agents. So, so the one thing, if you looked at data and you looked at, uh, at, at uh, children of parents who were smokers, and you look at children who were exposed in confined environments like cars to cigarette smoke, you see a great increase in the onset of asthma as a life occurrence in, in those children. So there are a number of things that you can become exposed to that really alter the ability of those airways to actually expand and recurl like they're supposed to, uh, that lead to this a condition that cause asthma from being genetic to being totally environmentally influenced. And then emphysema and chronic bronchitis. So bronchitis is an irritation of the bronchi, usually due to bacteria or viruses. And what happens there is you produce a copious amount of mucus trying to take care of the bacteria or virus. And then that mucus builds up inside the bronchi and restricts the lumen, which increases uh, resistance. So that's why uh, in a clinical environment you listen to the lungs because in a normal healthy person uh, the air flows without resistance and there's not a lot of sound. But if somebody has bronchitis really bad, they will. You can actually hear them with your with your own ear. You can hear them wheezing, what we call wheezing. You hear because the airways are narrow and resistance is becoming greater as you're trying to exchange air. So this is obviously a airway resistance problem where you have a tumor that has completely closed off the bronchi out of here. So this lung was not very functional at all. Uh, and then what actually happens, as we talked about yesterday, is if, if the tumor becomes metastasizes and goes all over the lungs, then what you end up with is displacing lung tissue with this wad of cells that is a tumor. So the reason why you die from cancer isn't necessarily that the cancer itself is toxic to you, it's that you displace functional tissue. And the more functional tissue that is displaced, the less function you get out of certain organs. So for example, this is metastatic cancer of the lung, where a good percentage of the lung now has totally been uh, been taken over by, by cancer. Uh, and you can see it associated with the tubes as well, where it begins to constrict the major uh, tubes going into the lungs, which greatly increases airway resistance and creates significant problems trying to breathe themselves. Oh. So the other was smoking. This is actually black lung here. So, so in black lung, what happens is they're exposed to real fine dust particles and then they're exposed to them at a high rate for a long period of time. And the entire lung gets, gets these dust particles in. So in a normal lung, remember we talked about the macrophages picking up dust particles, taking them to the surface. So in this lung, they had, they, they're now all over the lung because they can't keep up with the rate of the dust particles actually occur. And then this is tuberculosis. is a scarring and, and active areas where the bacteria was in the lung itself. So and it's a non -toxic. These are all non <coughs> So, as I told you, I don't pick on smokers, but I do try to convince, particularly people going into a clinical environment, that they probably shouldn't smoke. Even if they do, they should convince their they should they should try to convince their patients not to smoke. So the, the thing that always amazes me when I when I go to the hospital 
can I walk in the door and there's people dressed with with scrubs and stuff and I read their diagnosis as a respiratory therapist. <laughs> Those are the ones that just always get me as, as respiratory therapists throughout this. And it is very addictive, and I understand that it is very addictive. So I have always been interested in it, uh, partly because of my background in wildlife and ecology, is what kind of things we do to the environment that actually influences in a health uh, in bad ways. So I, I, when I first came here, I uh, got the library to start making a journal called Environmental Health Perspective, because it was a nice way to kind of look at the world around us and see what we do to the world and how it impacts health. And so this was a study that was released uh, on exposures of environmental toxins. And what it was related to is attention deficit hyperactivity. So the one thing we know in the United States uh, if you look at data, is more and more kids are being identified as having attention deficit disorder. So then the question has been, is it because historically we weren't good at catching it, so a lot of people went through school and had never been identified with attention deficit disorder, or is there actually a influence that is increasing so what this uh, so what the study did is look at two exposures that children had. So one was smoking uh, by parents, and then the other was lead and lead exposure due to lead paint and, and other uh, uh, events in, uh, in 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 cars. So so then the thing that most of you may not realize, and a few of you who are older will probably realize. Is that when I bought my first car, I bought gas that was called regular gas, and regular glass had lead in it. And then we figured out that it wasn't it was not a good idea to burn <laughs> that because it was putting lead in all the major cities in the atmosphere and people were breathing it in. So now when you buy a car, you have to buy unleaded gas. Alright. So this study was looking at exposure of lead. And the exposure was from uh, people who were older who were actually children when we were burning all of that leaded gas, like in LA and New, New York, where, where it was concentrated. And so what was interesting is that children whose mother smoked during pregnancy were two and a half times more likely to have attention deficit disorder than children who weren't parentally exposed to tobacco. So that, that was one. And then children whose blood levels were more than two micrograms per deciliter were four of lead were four times likely, more likely than children with levels at 0.8. Uh, and then just to make sense out of it, and the other thing I always try to get people to think about, uh, because it's, it's, it's always confused when it gets into public media, is why, do we, why does the government set regulations? And do the regulations actually assure that people aren't going to be exposed to things that are problematic health ones? And the answer is they set regulations to limit exposure, but they do not limit exposure at levels where people don't suffer. So we limit significant exposure, but, but still people can suffer from it. So, so what's interesting is, is if these kids had below 0.8 micrograms per deciliter, then their chance of getting attention deficit or were much less. But the government's acceptable blood level is 10 micrograms per deciliter. Five times larger than the two micrograms per liter that were leading to attention deficit disorder. So, so we would really have a, a we really have a policy that doesn't protect children. What are we supposed to do like other houses with and gas? Right now, uh, most old homes, if your home was built before the 50s, there's probably lead paint. So that anytime anybody does any sanding on, on any uh, woodwork in a home that was uh, pre-1950, or any removing of sheetrock or anything, then that all creates lead dust. Okay. 
that's probably the biggest exposure. Other than our dilemma in a global environment is that we can limit what we do in the United States, but we have neighbors, Canada and Mexico, who don't have the same regulations, and air carries pollutants globally. And so we have a lot of companies that have moved to Central and South America because they have less environmental restrictions. And then they pollute the air and it blows back out into the United States. That's the other source. So when I, years ago when I was working for the feds, one of the things I got to do, which was a great job <laughs> in the summertime, was I got to hike to all these remote alpine lakes in Wyoming and in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. So I get to, uh, to essentially go on backpack and trips into these beautiful, pristine areas and collect water. And then we set the water to, EPM to, to EPA to test. And I, I never found a lake in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem that it didn't have significant pollution, even though the ecosystem itself was relatively free of any industrialization. It's all being buried in the atmosphere. And then when it rains, what's it going to limit? So that's the other explorer that we, we have got here. So, anyway, <coughs> so based on the study, the estimate is that, that 5 million uh, 14, 15 year olds have higher than 2 microliters of blood, blood levels of lead. And are more susceptible to these deficits. So I think it answers the question of why we have an increase in the deficit in this part of the United States. It's just something I always ponder. I, sometimes it's, it's real depressing to ponder because you realize that it's just this enormous issue that it is almost impossible to manage because you've got political boundaries that limit our ability to do it. So this is what we're going to do at lab on uh, uh, tomorrow. So make sure you bring uh, bring the PowerPoint, and we'll talk through these these volumes tomorrow. We're relating them to what we're going to do uh, with this photometer tomorrow. Okay. <coughs> so what I, what we want to talk about now is uh, is we want to talk about internal and external respiration. So remember, internal respiration is how we move oxygen from our alveolar spaces into our blood, and how we move carbon dioxide out of our blood into our alveolar spaces within the lungs. So external respiration occurs within the lungs. Then as we said, the heart is uniquely designed so that the right side of the heart is receiving deoxygenated blood from the body and then pumping deoxygenated blood to the lungs. And so that's why when we looked at the lungs, the blue vessels in the lungs are branches of the pulmonary arteries because they're carrying the oxygen blood to the lungs. So the right side of our heart plays a very critical role in collecting the oxygen blood and taking it to the lungs where we can oxygenate it. So then the, the pulmonary veins actually come back from the lungs into the left side of the heart. And then the left side of the heart pumps all of that blood via the aorta out to the body. So the left side of the heart is bringing deoxygenated oxygenated blood into the heart from the lungs and then pumping that high oxygenated blood to our tissues. So then at our tissues, what we have are capillary bands where we have cells as this 
And within the cells, we have an RDL called the mitochondria. And so, the, if you want to be a reductionist of thought and reduce something to its simplest concept, then the only reason our body needs oxygen at all is because we have mitochondria. <laughs> and so our respiratory system and our cardiovascular system is designed to deliver oxygen to mitochondria. And the reason from last unit is that if we don't have oxygen, how many ATP can we make per glucose form? Six. Two. 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 If we have abundant oxygen, how many ATP can we make per glucose form? 36 to 38. There's a significant difference in that ATP. And you cannot make ATP fast enough if you're only making two per glucose molecule to actually cause your organs, who are the biggest consumers of that oxygen, your brain and your heart, to actually survive. So, what we want to do in internal respiration is we want to get the oxygen off of the blood and deliver it to ourselves to our mitochondria. And then the waste product created by the mitochondria is CO2. And so we want to put the CO2 in our blood. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at factors that influence that capacity to do external respiration here and internal respiration at our tissues. So the factors we're going to look at are the partial pressure of gases. So when you're thinking about a partial pressure, what you're essentially saying is that what you have to do is you have to understand that our atmosphere is not monolithic and only comprised of one gas, but it's comprised of a number of gases. So then if we think about our atmosphere, then we've got this pressure in our atmosphere uh, and at sea level it would be one atmosphere of pressure. Okay. Well, that pressure that we can measure is created by the movement of all the molecules that are in the atmosphere. And so the relative movement of those molecules against the surface is defined as pressure. And so the most common things in our atmosphere is nitrogen gas, oxygen, and then we can use water vapor as well, and then it just goes on and on and on and on. Okay. So what we're essentially saying with partial pressure is that if we have one atmosphere of pressure over here, then that pressure is the sum pressure of the pressure of each of these gases. Does that make sense? And so partial pressure is defined. So if we were saying, well, what's the partial pressure of oxygen? We're saying if we have one atmosphere, how much of the one atmosphere is due to oxygen alone? But the, the, the pressure is due to all these other gases as well. Does that make sense? So we're actually trying to define the, the pressure of, of a particular gas in a mosaic of gas. So then the other thing is alveolar surface area. So we've talked about that. So the alveolar surface area in our lungs is maximized because our lung is divided into lobules. The lobules are made up of a number of alveolar sacs that are made up of a number of alveoli. So if we have emphysema where alveoli <coughs> collapse, then we get those big air spaces but what's happening to alveolar surface? It's reducing. So that would be one of the ways that alveolar surface area would be reduced by damage to the lungs uh, due to emphysema. So the one in the Pacific Northwest that's been problematic because of a mining operation that occurred in, in Troy, Montana, and in a big company uh, called Grace that was in Spokane that made asbestos and then all of the workers that were either mining or 
or in this company, were exposed to asbestos fibers, and a high percentage of them are now suffering and or dying from the damage of asbestos fibers to the lungs. So what asbestos is, is like little ground glass shards. And when you get them into your lungs, every time you breathe in and out, they bounce around in there and destroy alveolar surface area. And so there's some significant health issues that have been associated with that. Then the third one is just the diffusion rate and distance. So the diffusion rate is going to be driven by the size of each of these molecules. And the basic, the basic pattern is the larger the molecule, the slower or faster the rate of diffusion. Or slower the rate of diffusion, right. So, so diffusion rate is really going to be dependent on what, what the molecule is that we're referring to. The distance, remember, is what we're trying to minimize here, because we have an alveolar, type 1 alveolar cell here, basement membrane, a little bit of areolar connective tissue, interstitial fluid, a little bit of areolar connective tissue, basal membrane, and endothelium, which is a squamous cell. So we're mitigating the distance by using squamous cells that where the surface where diffusion is occurring and the blood vessel that the gas is diffusing into has got a very short distance at which the, the molecule has to move. Then the fourth thing is the solubility of each gas. Uh, and so what actually happens for us to exchange externally and internally is we have to be that we're exchanging in an aqueous environment. So we actually have to have oxygen go from a gas in a, in a gaseous form in the atmosphere and be converted to a dissolved gas in a liquid. So it's very similar to what is required in surface water, is that surface water uh, exchanges oxygen with the oxygen. And so if you're a fisherman and you're wanting to catch certain species of fish that have real high oxygen demands, and you have to go to rivers that have lots of rapids because the fall of water through rapids oxidizes, just like an aerator. Yeah, and so it it's, makes it very predictable of where certain fish species are going to be. If you want to catch fish like carp that aren't that can tolerate real low oxygen levels, then you can go to a, a stream that has no flow. And, and so periodically in Long Lake, just north of us here in the summertime that will go through several days of no wind and fish will die in the lake because the wave action on shores helps oxygenate the water. So and then the last one we're going to look at is a magic molecule called hemoglobin. And what we're going to look at is hemoglobin's capacity to draw oxygen to it which is, is what we define as affinity. Okay. And so what I'm going to tell you is life as we know it on Earth for warm-blooded and cold-blooded animals could not exist without hemoglobin. Because we don't have enough atmospheric oxygen to actually do anything but be a single celled organism. So, what allows multicellular organisms to survive on Earth is a capacity to carry blood internally and hemoglobin. So, insects have hemoglobin, most animals have some form of hemoglobin demand. Otherwise, we would all be little single celled organisms and we'd never become a multicellular organism. Okay, so Dalton's law is the one that deals with this concept, that we have this state in the atmosphere, and we have all the gases in the atmosphere, and all these gases then make up a partial pressure. Uh, each gas, excuse me, makes up 
part of the pressure of the total pressure. All right. So what Dalton said was atmospheric pressure is the sum total of all the partial pressures of gas in the atmosphere. So if you actually look at that, then the most common gas in our atmosphere <coughs> is actually nitrogen gas at 78%. And then nitrogen gas is two nitrogen molecules triply bonded together. The next gas is actually oxygen, and oxygen's at 21%. And then oxygen is two oxygen atoms, doubly bonded. And so I'm doing that because we're going to come back and talk about molecular weight <laughs> and capacity to, to exchange gas. And carbon dioxide is less than 1%. So that's what I always like about the global warming issue of the elevated carbon dioxide level. And so it's like, why would we care about making this more than 1%? Because if you understand what Dalton is saying, if this goes up, something else is going to go down because you can't go over 100%. Mm. Yeah, we never hear that. Yeah. And then carbon dioxide is actually our largest gas because it's two oxygen molecules. And any other molecules will just taper off and taper off. Okay. So, because oxygen is only 21% in our atmosphere, is why we have to have the beam of the hook to help us concentrate oxygen in our blood. So the other thing that Dalton looked at was understanding that the Earth, because it's spinning on its axis, acts as a centrifuge. And in a centrifuge, the heaviest things are drawn toward the center of gravity, and lighter things are left further away from gravity. So that's exactly what we used last week with the urine, to take everything that was suspended in the urine and bring it down to the bottom of the tube so that when we looked at it under a microscope slide, we could see more things at once than have to look through a bunch of urine to see a few things. So if that makes sense, then which gas would obviously be closest to the Earth's surface? Carbon dioxide. Exactly right, because it's the heaviest gas. So as we go up in, in elevation away from the Earth's surface, then carbon dioxide levels drop appreciably. So the other thing that happens, which is really interesting, is if you like to go exploring in caves, or if you were a, or if you were a worker who goes down into old mine shafts, then that's even closer to the center of gravity. So as you go down into a mine shaft, the relative amount of carbon dioxide actually increases, which is why all mines have to be ventilated and they have to move airflow through them. And when that stops, people die in the mine. Yeah. So that's why they have to have the oxygen support and stuff if they get trapped, because what's going to build up in the mine is CO2. All right. All right. So what we're more interested in is oxygen, actually. So if you look at this figure, and it says the partial pressure of oxygen in this particular picture is, is 159. If you actually calculate it using the standard atmospheric pressure of 760, which would be one atmosphere of pressure, at sea level it would be right at that, or, or 160. So at sea level is where we would have the highest amount of oxygen available. As we go away from sea level, the oxygen level is actually drop. Okay. So there is less oxygen in Spokane than there is in Seattle down on the waterfront. All right. 
So if you look at that, then if you go to 10,000 feet, then it drops to 110. If you go to 20,000 feet, it drops to 73. If you go to 50,000 feet, it drops to 18. So that's why when you get on a jet plane, before they take off, the flight attendants go through the little spiel about if this plane decompresses, these little things will fall out of the roof. Please put yours on before you assist anyone else. Because at 40,000 feet, you're going to have more oxygen inside you than outside. And air and, and exchange is actually going to reverse itself in your lungs. And you're not going to draw oxygen to you into your blood. You're going to be losing oxygen from your blood. So that's why they tell you that, because if you try to help someone else, there's a good chance you're not going to survive long enough to put your mask on you. But I, I don't ever worry about that when I fly. Because the only reason you'd lose the oxygen is because there's a hole in the plane. <laughs> and at 600 miles per hour, unless you are tightly in your seat, you're just going to get sucked right out of the hole. Kind of like driving with a window open down the road and all the papers fly out of the window. So then I think, okay, so that's why they say, if you're not moving around, please put your seatbelt on. Just in case. But then I also don't worry about that because the temperature at 40,000 <laughs> is going to be cold enough that you're going to die in 10 to 15 minutes of hypothermia. So then it's like, mm, four minutes and your brain passes out from the lack of oxygen. Fifteen minutes shivering before you pass out. <laughs> Not sure which one's ordered. So I, I'm a real skeptic. But it's still safer to get on that plane than to leave the campus and drive anywhere in Spokane. <laughs> you just look at at risk amount. So anyway, when you get on a plane, make sure all the blankets are right above you. Because <laughs> then you'll know. Then there's all kinds of other fun trivia you can learn about planes. So if, if the plane blows up, and you're ejected out of the plane <laughs> over water, they know that you died because you were ejected out of the plane. Because when you hit the water, the impact explodes all your clothes off and everybody's naked. <laughs> or if you're in the plane and the plane goes into the water, then your clothes are still on you, so they, they actually can tell from the right. <laughs> Find them in a lot of stuff. <laughs> So I was actually reading that article while I was playing on the plane. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Henry is another law. And so what Henry is going to deal with is solubility. So solubility of a gas is determined by the solubility coefficient of gas. And I don't want to go into a lot of detail on how a solubility coefficient is calculated, but it's based upon the molecular makeup of the gas, how readily hydrogen bonds with water, and its size. <laughs> so the negative, the negative positive charges on the molecule plus its size is its size. But if we wanted to look at it in terms of the major gases in our atmosphere, the larger the solubility coefficient, the more soluble a gas is. Okay. So which gas up here is the most soluble? CO2, yeah, because it's got the largest solubility coefficient. And we actually carry a percentage of, of carbon dioxide just dissolved in our blood because it's the most soluble gas. So we really don't need hemoglobin to carry carbon dioxide. <laughs> right. But look at the difference between carbon dioxide and oxygen for solubility coefficient. Oxygen is just not real soluble. And since oxygen is not real soluble, 
then we need hemoglobin to carry oxygen because we can concentrate the oxygen we carry in our blood with hemoglobin. The good news is, even though nitrogen makes up most of our atmosphere, is it's just not soluble at all, relatively. So what impacts solubility is so if you increase pressure, you increase relative amount of solubility. And that's what purveyors of soft drinks know, and that's what they do. So you have a can of Pepsi, or a jar of Pepsi, and it's under pressure. But as soon as you open that lid, what happens? And if you don't, if you don't realize it, just get a get a, a bottle of Pepsi, shake it a whole bunch, and then open the lid, <laughs> and then you'll get an experience. And what happens is you drop the pressure, so carbon dioxide becomes less soluble and bubbles out of solution. So all beverages, champagne, beer. And, and soft drinks that are carbonated, what they've done is force carbon dioxide into solution under pressure. Then as soon as you open the container, pressure drops and carbon dioxide becomes insoluble and it bubbles out of the solution. Isn't that cool? So, nitrogen is quite interesting because if you take a a container and you fill it with atmospheric air, you put it on your back and you go underwater, what happens with each foot of descent as you go underwater with pressure? Increases. Pressure increases. So as you get down to about 50 feet, then there's significant enough pressure on you that nitrogen becomes Soluble. And as long as you are under pressure, the nitrogen gas is going to stay soluble in your blood. Now, if you come up real rapidly, what happens? Pressure drops rapidly, and you just become a Pepsi bottle. <laughs> and all the nitrogen in your blood begins to bubble out a solution, and that's what we call the Bins. So what do we do? Somebody did that. We put them in a compression chamber, a barometric compression chamber, drive the pressure up on the body, and slowly release the pressure, and hope that all the nitrogen comes out of the solution in your lungs instead of all over your body. Yeah. So all due to solubility. So if you want to go skip that, just remember that you don't want to be a pest. It's really bad for you. It kills you. <laughs> Have all those bubbles in you. Okay. So that leads us to the last thing, which is our magic molecule, hemoglobin. All right. So hemoglobin, we're going to do it in detail uh, in the next year. But for our purposes right now, I just need to know that hemoglobin has a heme unit, which is an iron. And every hemoglobin has four of these heme units. And each heme unit can carry one O2. Each hemoglobin molecule can carry four molecular oxygen. So that's what you need to know. So when you're looking at this graph, then the graph is the graphs we're going to look at are percent saturation of hemoglobin uh, and partial pressure of oxygen. So the way to think about it is if we just did it in 25s, 
then if there's only one oxygen on my beam, then it's 25% saturated, right? If we add a second oxygen to the heme, it becomes 50% saturated. If I add a third oxygen, then it's 75% saturated. If I add the fourth oxygen, it's 100% saturated. Okay. So that's at the molecular level, at the hemoglobin level. So notice that we never reach 100%. So, so we're, we're somewhere between 90, about 98%. So what we're saying, under normal physiology, we have a few heme that are completely full with oxygen. And that's the way our body works. Usually if you're in a clinical environment and the person is in respiratory distress and they're at 98, you're just as happy as pie because they're doing really well. We don't worry until those numbers drop below 90. And when they drop below 90, then it's like, ooh, we got to do something. So we would buy oxygen. drive that percent saturation up, which is why we give oxygen in the clinical environment. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So the basic thing to understand is that partial pressure is going to help us facilitate the saturation. That's because partial pressure influences the solubility of oxygen. So it goes back to Henry's law. So if we can increase partial pressure, then we can increase solubility, which makes more oxygen available to human. Right? So in, in essence, what we do with oxygen in a clinical environment is increase partial pressure, facilitate solubility, and drive more oxygen even. Okay. So that's the theory behind it. So that's the given that partial pressure influences solubility. The higher the partial pressure, the greater the solubility, and the more saturated your hemoglobin will be. Okay. So what influences it are things that occur in the blood. So changes in blood pH are going to affect the, the ability of oxygen to be attracted to hemoglobin. And the basic thing is the more acidic your blood, the less saturated your hemoglobin. The more basic your blood, the more saturated your hemoglobin. We're going to look at that in a moment. So then the other thing we're going to look at is the influence of carbon dioxide on this process. And so the basic thing would be is as we inc increase the partial pressure of carbon dioxide, we decrease the solubility of hemoglobin. And the reason is, is because carbon dioxide interacts with water to form carbonic acid and causes the blood to become more acidic. So the more carbon dioxide load in your blood, the more acidic your blood becomes, uh, the less oxygenated your, ox your blood is going to be. Okay. And then the third thing we're going to look at is blood temperature. And basically, the cooler your blood, the higher the affinity for oxygen. The warmer your blood, the lower the affinity for oxygen. Which is why when you have a temperature of 105, 106, most people just want to do what? Sleep. And they're actually wanting to sleep all the time because the brain is beginning to starve for oxygen. So that's why it's so critically important that you cool them down so that they can oxygenate the brain. So that's why in a clinical environment, if somebody's got that high fever, you're putting cold packs on them, you're, you're doing things plus drugs that help change them. So the inverse is true. If you decided you were going to go swimming in the Spokane River this afternoon, <laughs> then in about 10 minutes, your blood temperature is going to get so 
cool that you're going to have 100% saturation of hemoglobin, but the oxygen doesn't want to come off the blood at your tissues. <laughs> and so we could do the blood analysis, and you say, my God, the person's 100% saturated. But their brain's dying. Because the oxygen's not coming out of the blood. <laughs> All right? All right. So then the fourth thing that you just need to know is that while we're making red blood cells, we make a compound before they're released from our bone marrow. Uh, and it's called 2,3-bis-phosphoglycerate, uh, BPG. And it that facilitates this process. So we're not going to talk about that because clinically it would be rare that you would see a shift in BPG uh, in, in red blood cells. But it is one of the reasons why we have to replace red blood cells every, every 120 days is because we lose BBP as the blood cells uh, age. And so that is one of the limiting factors to the effectiveness of red blood cells over time. Because we got rid of our DNA. And since we got rid of our DNA and we don't have a nucleus, we now can't make any more BPT while we're circulating. Where fish have nucleated red blood cells, and they last a lot longer in circulation because they can do it. <laughs> and, but they're in an aqueous environment, which stabilizes our O2 levels. Yeah. All right. So when you look at pH, then the lower the, lower the pH, the more acidic the pH then the lower the percent saturation of hemoglobin. So remember, these are saturation curves. So if your blood pH were to reach 7.2, you would never be able to reach 90% saturation, which is why in a clinical environment, in an intensive care unit, you are constantly monitoring blood pH. Because if you forget and they got a metabolic problem that's driving blood pH more acidic. Then they could be dead by the time you come back to ever remember what you're doing. So that's why we constantly monitor blood pH in a intensive care unit because it's going to drive their out. So we actually want our blood to be slightly higher. Now, what I will tell you is that if this happened, there's a good chance you would die. And if this happens, there's a good chance you're going to die. <laughs> so even though this curve is showing shifts in blood pH, our normal blood is 7.4. And we don't like it to go above 7.45 or below 7.35. So our body does not do well with one shift in pH. And we're going to talk about how the lungs and kidney help us with that. Great. So I want you to think about something. It's kind of cool. So, uh, so if I take carbon dioxide and I bubble it through water, uh, then I deform carbonic acid. And carbonic acid dissociates for minor ions and a bicarbonate. So if I add carbon dioxide to my blood, the blood is going to become more acidic or more basic. More acidic, right? Where do I add carbon dioxide to my blood? External respiration or internal respiration? Internal. <laughs> we have to have a consensus. <laughs> internal respiration, which is occurring at our cells, right? Because where's the carbon dioxide made? By our mitochondria. So then what happens is in the capillary beds in skeletal muscle, capillary beds in cardiac muscle, capillary beds in your brain, 
we're actually adding carbon dioxide to our blood and making our blood more acidic, which is decreasing the affinity for between oxygen and hemoglobin. So that actually allows us to take oxygen off the hemoglobin and give it to our cells. It's just a fact that we're adding carbon dioxide to the blood and making the blood more. Isn't that good? Now what's happening in external respiration? Where is the carbon dioxide going? Out. Out. So in our lungs, the blood is becoming more basic. And as the blood becomes more basic, hemoglobin and oxygen come together more easily. So we're using carbon dioxide, a waste product in our body, to adjust blood pH to facilitate the release of oxygen in internal respiration from hemoglobin and driving oxygen onto hemoglobin in external respiration. Isn't that so cool? So look at this. So compare this graph to this graph, and they are identical. Because if we if we increase the partial pressure of carbon dioxide, the blood is becoming more acidic. And if we decrease the pressure of carbon dioxide, the blood is becoming more basic. So the two are inherently linked to one another in normal physiology. Your capacity to carry carbon dioxide and change the pH of blood and facilitate the loss of O2 from hemoglobin or the addition of O2 from hemoglobin. And we'll, we'll stop there. But it's, it's just so much cool stuff.